Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another webinar in our weekly series of, of webinars dealing with issues on the security and geopolitics of Northeast Asia and the Korean Peninsula. Northeast Asia, as everybody here knows, is a tough neighborhood. And the largest presence on the block is, is China. And like every major power, China has great hungers and enormous stresses that it has to deal with. We have three very distinguished panelists, each one experts in different areas and with a lot of experience dealing with uh, the technological issues, the political issues and the regional issues of, uh, of, of Northeast Asia that we're gonna be talking about. Our first presenter this afternoon, we are honored to have the Honorable Cliff Stearns, who's a former 12-term congressman from Florida's 6th District. That was a, a particularly busy time from 1989 to 2013, a time of major technological changes, including the advent of the internet. Congressman Stearns is currently Director of Global Solutions for APCO Worldwide, which is an advisory and advocacy communications consultant firm that helps public and private sector or organizations successfully navigate the uncertain waters of today's business, political, and social turbulence. As a member of Congress serving on the subcommittees that deal with the key issues of commerce and technology, he gained extensive experience in telecommunications technology, cybersecurity, and international trade. And we're very happy to have him with us this afternoon. Welcome, welcome, Congressman Stearns. Larry, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you and delighted to be with the other members of the uh, panel. Uh, as you mentioned, I served in Congress uh, 24 years. I like to think of it in terms of 16 elections. As, as anyone will know, when your name is on the ballot, you're awfully nervous, whether it's primaries or general. And in this uh, political climate today, it is extre extremely uh, difficult to be calm because of there's so much ideology and so much uh, back and forth through social media. But I'm delighted to share my thoughts uh, dealing with the topic of the driver of China's behavior, and more in particularly, uh, the conflicting demands that are coming from China, as well as the stress points and fractures, as you point out in the title. I think it's obvious that uh, when they had the meeting in Alaska uh, with uh, the United States and China, uh, the China list all the wrongdoings of the US. So obviously we have a lot of wrongdoings that we think of when we think of China, not to mention the South China Sea, uh, their encroachment into Taiwan, uh, their military and space buildup. And at the same time, uh, President Biden is trying to coerce them into a energy climate control policy, which is antithetical to what they really want to do is build more coal mines. And uh, they're so doing it and they didn't show up for the climate control and either did Russia. So between the energy um, concerns of the United States, uh, technology dealing with semiconductors, as well as human rights, uh, there's lots of, shall we say, positive and negative behavior on both sides. But I noticed in the Chinese, when they met with uh, our meeting, our folks in Alaska, the Chinese vice foreign minister talked about some things that they felt was very serious. And that was suppression of uh, Chinese companies like Huawei. Uh, they talked about harassing Chinese students and attacks on the Confucius Institute. We know these Confucius Institutes are in universities across our country. There's one in George Washington University here in DC. Um, and they wanted, and we finally were able to get the expedited uh, executive from Huawei, their chief financial officer. Uh, so they had a list of wrongdoings. And of course, we had our own list and we started out with South China Sea. And the South China Sea is extremely important for the maritime uh, activities of both the United States and Vietnam, as well as Japan and Australia and other countries. So I think that's a worthwhile uh, behavioral 
activity by China that we got to control and, and be sure that we understand that there's ways that we can work around it because we have to have that trade. Um, there's an area also that uh, is a very much concern and that is Taiwan. We see their military uh, flying overhead with military uh, planes. We also see them building up uh, their their, inter their coastal uh, rockets and uh, weaponry. So Taiwan is a really a sore point for us because um, we want to make sure that Taiwan remains free. And there's something about Taiwan, Taiwan that a lot of Americans don't know about, and that is the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. There's only three firms in the world who actually have a significant impact on developing semiconductors, Samsung Electronics, Intel, and Taiwan Semiconductors. And they, in fact, uh, about three-fifths of all spending on semiconductors was those three companies. So you think about for what semiconductors are used for, not only for computers and for uh, the, so the Apple Watch, but also all the automotive um, industry. I don't know, you know, lots of us buy new cars, not lots of us buy used car, but even now a used car has so much technology that it takes you a while to understand how to use it all. Uh, I have a, uh, a used Lexus and uh, now every time I come into the garage, it beeps that I'm too close to the garage side. And also it has uh, iPhone will work through it. And so all my mm -hmm. phone calls come through the, the automobile uh, display. I tell you that because the semiconductors are the key aspect of the automobile industry and the three large semiconductors manufacturer uh, have to continue to invest. And China obviously is on the out with this semiconductor production and research. So in a way, if they could get access to Taiwan, even in a relationship, something like they have with Hong Kong, where they could put in their rules and regulation and not necessarily have the communists running it, uh, that would be a win for them. So that is probably one of the biggest concerns I think that a lot of the uh, military have, and probably the administration does too, because with two thirds of the world ship production uh, and those three companies, you have a crucial uh, point where uh, satisfying new technology is gonna be important. And of course, with Russia uh, and China, both sort of, uh, competing with us, they'll want to increase their technology at the same time. So it's really a harassment of Taiwan is what the Chinese is doing. And I think all of us realize that, that we've got to cope with it somehow. I'll close by, by giving some comments on the real estate market in China, which I think uh, if, if all of you should know that recently the Federal Reserve just came out with a uh, announcement on the Chinese real estate market they feel that some of the troubles could possibly spill over to the US because uh, there's a lot of almost 50 Chinese companies that are near bankruptcy. And of course the, uh, the largest one is Evergrande. That has uh, sort of rattled, rattled the global investors. Uh, uh, the company has attempted to avoid official default and the Chinese government has stepped in and uh, said they're not going to bail them out like they like uh, we did for our 2008, 2009 Great Recession. Uh, but the concern is that how are they going to succeed and survive, uh, even though the Chinese government has given them a bridge loan, um, this real estate is really a propelling economic engine for China and it stresses their entire economy because of the uh, spillover, the possibility of bankruptcy of not only Evergrande, but many of these other other uh, real estate developers. And I think if you look in China today, you see that what these real estate de developers did is they built these high rise uh, apartment buildings and then they sold the units to the Chinese uh, citizen, but mm -hmm. the citizens didn't move in. What they did actually was bet on the fact that they could sell it again once it was completed. So they buy it before it's developed. Once it's developed, they try and sell it. And it was sort of a, uh, a spillover where they keep thinking they're gonna make more and more money by reselling it. So a lot of these huge uh, real estate developments are vacant and there's nobody in them. And at this point, the uh, Evergrande is defaulting. And so the people are reluctant to move in 
And in some cases, the Chinese government is for some developers who actually can are defaulting smaller ones, they're demolishing the buildings. Um, so the long and short of it is the recent uh, announcement by the uh, Federal Reserve about the possible spillover. Uh, they're not overly concerned, but they say there's a possibility. So I'll conclude by saying there is both sides of the uh, uh, Pacific, uh, whether the United States or China, there is some wrongdoing that both countries can point to. And it's going to be a challenge for the Biden administration to try and work through these with the same time, not move us into, uh, shall we say, uh, a dangerous, uh, more than a cold war. So Larry, I think that sort of concludes my overall topics on the uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cliff. That was uh... A uh, very interesting set of comments. We're going to have a lot to talk about when, when we finish our presentations. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Doug Bondo, uh, who's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, and we go back quite a ways together. Uh, he specializes in foreign policy, civil liberties, and, and many other areas. He, served, he worked as a special assistant to President Ronald Reagan, although he hardly looks old enough to have done that, and uh, editor of the political magazine Inquiry. He writes regularly for a lot of publications. You've almost certainly read something about him in perhaps Fortune Magazine or the National Interest or the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Times. He's published numerous articles on geopolitical issues in all the leading journals, uh, also including foreign policy. Also, he's appeared in uh, Time, Newsweek, the New York Times, and he is the winner of the coveted H.L. Mencken Award, uh, which causes envy in me for best editorial or op-ed column, uh, and he's trained in law. So, Doug, welcome, welcome back. Thanks, Larry. It's always a pleasure to be on with you and everyone else. Uh, we have a great panel today, a lot of very important issues to talk about. I mean, the U.S. faces a lot of enormous challenges, but I think of those, of the international ones at least, China's the biggest. <laughs> and it's important as we look at China not to assume that everything will end up badly or that we'll end up in war, that we've got to ensure we have a peaceful century and a peaceful relationship. It's going to be a challenge. And if we're thinking about the issues that we face with China, I mean, this is a very complex set of questions. And that's what makes, I think, the China question so much more difficult than many others. I mean, dealing with Iran or Russia or others, now these are not easy themselves, but China brings in so many issues. So if we're trying to understand why China does what it does, you know, what drives Chinese behavior, what pushes them to act the way they do, some of which, of course, were quite offended by, I think there are a number of factors it's worth thinking about. The first is simple nationalism, that this is a, a, a people, this, and this is more than the, the People's Republic of China. I mean, I think this is something where it's China, that uh, you know, ethnic Chinese around the world have an affinity for Chinese civilization, Chinese history, and uh, certainly the Chinese regime today, the leadership, Xi Jinping, you know, there is a lot of nationalism there. I've lectured a lot to students. The students are nationalists. So they believe that, you know, Taiwan is part of China. They believe that China, you know, should do certain things. So that's a very important aspect of this. So when we think of something like Taiwan, we look at it as, well, this is, it should be an independent country. They look at it as, in a sense, as our American Civil War, where the Union said, no, this is a Union, you don't get to leave. You know, so we have to understand the emotion that goes through that. So nationalism is a very important factor here. And what makes it tough, of course, is it's very hard to kind of trade that away. People have those passions that are very strong. Uh, yeah. Also history, and history kind of ties into some degree. But uh, Chinese talk about the century of humiliation. You know, that imperial China at one point was a dominant power. It was the most important, in many ways, country in the world. It had the largest GDP going back a very long time as a civilization. And then it all fell apart. And especially in the 1800s, the uh, 1900s, you know, they kind of lost everything. I mean, Hong Kong exists because 
you know, the United Kingdom stole it in the, in the opium wars, basically. You know, Taiwan is independent or uh, so separate. I have to be very careful using that term. It's separate from China because Japan defeated China and took the island. You know, Macau, I mean, these, so the Chinese, this, this, all these issues tie into history in a way that Americans, you know, some Americans, you know, still look at the Civil War and have that as an impact. But for China, these issues matter and tie into the nationalism issue. There's also the question of security. I mean, every country is worried about, you know, national security. China is surrounded by 14 land, you know, kind of borders, and then as well as maritime borders. And China has variously been at war with Russia, India, Japan, Vietnam, and Korea. You know, so they do have legitimate uh, you know, security issues. I mean, and you can blame the, the PRC, the People's Republic of China, for a number of those wars. But the reality is Chinese government is going to be very sensitive on these things. And that explains, for example, why the People's Liberation Army and all the services have been growing. You know, they view these as being an issue of national security for them. And then there's economic growth. I mean, China, you know, going back a very long time, was, it was actually a very advanced country. But as you got into the 19th century, 20th century, very impoverished. And you kind of, you see what Chinese people went through, the immiserating poverty that they suffered under. You know, the, uh, the great success of the PRC and the way they sell their record is having delivered China from that poverty. And of course, that deliverance came because they moved towards the marketplace. I mean, that, that's, that's post uh, Mao Zedong, that's post his death in 1976. But that matters a lot to them. If you have a population of 1.4 billion people, how do you lift them out? How do you end you know, poverty? So they, these are issues, again, that are critically important for them. They're concerned about trade routes. You know, the, the trade has been their way out of poverty. Now, they'd like to have more domestic demand. They'd like to be less reliant on the, the rest of the world, especially given the relationship with the U.S. and how that's been going. Nevertheless, they are concerned about trade routes because those tie in to uh, you know, their prosperity. And, and so you look at both the large Navy, you look at uh, the BRI initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, these are issues that tie into economics. Energy is another issue. And again, it ties in with all of these things. Much of the energy comes via trade. I mean, they get uh, you know, oil from the Persian Gulf, for example. So they want that energy for economic growth, a very heavy energy user in the you know, increased economic production. So those issues then matter to them. They worry about energy production and they worry about getting it. Uh, you know, and they like the idea, for example, through BRI of getting access, guaranteeing access to other energy sources. So again, these things kind of tie together. When you start looking at their, their policies, you realize they have a number of different objectives. And there's also ideology. Now, I don't think that China today is a Marxist, kind of, you know, whether it's Marxist, Leninist or whatever, I don't really think it's Marxist anymore. I mean, this is a, a country where capitalists join the Communist Party. But I do think it's a Leninist party. That is, this is a party that believes it should rule. And there are reasons for that. I mean, one of them, I think, is in fact an ideological belief that that's the way that uh, you know, the kind of the, the mechanism for Chinese growth, the mechanism to lead China. It has to be a dominant party that controls the state and sets down the rules. And Xi Jinping has been pushing very hard for party uh, you know, kind of control and personal control. I mean, we're back to really a personal dictatorship a la Mao Zedong in my view. You know, and there's also, of course, this is convenient if you're a member of the ruling party, you like the idea of it ruling because then uh, you get all the goodies and you, know, you get to enjoy ordering everybody else around. And there's, I think, also a practical fear. And it's easy to dismiss this, but I think it's very real. A concern about instability, a concern about chaos, a concern that a large country like China can fall apart, disillusion. Uh, I mean, they, they rail against separatism. I mean, it's one of the issues in, they, you know, they complain that the Taiwanese, the Hong Kongers, separatists, you know, they denounce that. I mean, it's a violation now of the national security law. You know, so so this, this is a sense of the country itself in their view, you know, can be threatened by this. You know, so all of these factors, I think, come together in a very, very powerful way. And so what we're seeing today, unfortunately coming out of that, is a China that's more repressive. I mean, if you look domestically, you know, whether it be Uyghurs, whether it be religious persecution generally, you know, the, uh, the end of independent journalists, the, uh, you know, they wiped out human rights lawyers. I mean, you know, more internet controls, et cetera, what's happened in Hong Kong, et cetera. You know, so we see more repressive, we see more aggressive. 
uh, you know, in diplomatic uh, terms of wolf warrior diplomacy. I think it's backfired on them, but it's popular at home, as well as military maneuvers. The ideological that we're seeing that now, Xi Jinping is seeking, you know, to have his third term, probably going to be ratified this week. At least that's the, the betting with the party conclave, you know, a lot more ideology. They're rewriting history, et cetera. So all of these things are they're pushing. Our challenge is how to respond to that. And I think we want to play a long game that, uh, you know, Chinese history doesn't end tomorrow, that uh, very important to realize that Xi Jinping is not the end of the argument. In 1976, we would have looked at China and said, this is hopeless. Then Mao Zedong died, Deng Xiaoping took over, and suddenly there's economic reform and a very different China. So I think that the future is open. What we have to do is realize nothing is decided. We have to be sophisticated. We have to, we have to take on each of these issues. It's not going to be easy. We need to work with friendly countries. And we, need to not, we do not want to treat China as an enemy. We don't want to turn them into one. This is a difficult relationship. This is one which I hope both parties can work together on. And we need to work with uh, Europeans. We need to work with Asian friends. You know, this is, this is a challenge, frankly, for much of the world, not just the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, you spoke very eloquently and, and I was intrigued about uh, the things you said about history and their, their century of humiliation. I wanna get back to that when we get into our, our discussion. Uh, and uh, maybe reference, what was it, Michael Pillsbury's book, uh, The Hundred Year Marathon, and their sense of manifest destiny. Uh, our concluding speaker is the venerable Mr. Humphrey Hoxley, uh, correspondent for BBC, and he is the author of Asian Waters, The Struggle Over the Indo-Pacific and the Challenge to American Power. He wrote the definitive book so far on the Chinese island building that's going on. And it'd be interesting to hear, because that came out a couple of years ago at least, and it'd be interesting to hear based on things that have happened since then, if anything has changed that if he were to do a reprint of the book, what would he, what would he update in that or how would he amend it if, if at all? Um, he is a, a journalist, of course, his uh, uh, his reporting with the BBC has taken him to every crisis point in the world, including uh, uh, Delhi, Colombo, Manila, especially in Asia, Hong Kong. And for many years, he was the BBC's Asia bureau chief based in Beijing. His reporting and commentary have appeared in all the mainstream media in the UK and the US. And his lecture venues include the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, the RAND Corporation, which was the original think tank in Los Angeles and uh, Cambridge in the UK. Uh, he also has his own podcast, his own webinar series like we have here, the monthly host of the Democracy Forum Debates. It's a webcast that deals with topics on the Asian region. And he is also, he also writes novels and he's darn good at it. He's uh, got about nine of those under his belt. These are international thrillers with compelling heroes and nonstop action. I have one going on my bedside table right now. And, uh, and uh, a few hours after this is over, I'm gonna get back to it. Welcome Humphrey. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. That's, that's, that's very kind. And, and it's a real privilege to be here. I've got to say I'm in London and I was expecting to be at odds with my co-panelists, but I find that from semiconductors to playing the long game, I'm, I'm sort of on the same page as them, which gives me uh, great optimism. And, and I'd like to sort of congratulate you, Larry, for the title uh, of this discussion, The Drivers of China's Behaviour, because I don't think enough debate focuses on this. I mean, what are the drivers of any of our behaviours? Why do we do what we do? What would happen if people understood us earlier, had mentored us, encouraged us and stopped us from doing the wrong things? And I'm saying this is in reference to China because since, say, let's say 1989, uh, the Tiananmen Square protests repression and massacres there, China's barely put a foot wrong uh, with its poverty alleviation, its infrastructure building, its capturing of a global imagination of its achievements such that not many years back, my government here in Britain launched a golden era with China uh, in which China was going to help build our high-speed railway, our nuclear power stations, our cell phones and the rest. 
When I say not many years back, I mean, we're less than five years ago on that one. But that's not the case anymore. Things have got frosty. And that is largely our fault because our elected leaders, in my view, failed to read uh, or ignored the intelligence reports of what China actually is. And we've heard Doug Bando uh, explain that in a fairly sort of succinct way just now. China has stayed constant, um, but our leaders and our policies, as Cliff Stern knows from his many elections, uh, flip-flop with every election. So you never quite know what you're going to get uh, in a Western democracy. Uh, so Xi Jinping, as we just heard, the current leader, he's cementing his third term. And he's made, made no secret that China wants to be strong enough to prevent another era of colonization, that century of humiliation that we heard about just now. Uh, and it is now set on the track to move forward and build a great modern socialist nation, a natural rival, therefore, to America's great democratic and capitalist nation. China's goal hasn't changed. The challenge to us in the West is that more governments are buying into the Chinese argument that advocates authoritarianism, while our advocacy of democracy, or at least the export of it, is lying stained in the deserts and mountains of Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm going to get back to that in a moment. So what are the drivers of China's behavior that come across our desks and onto our headlines? The South China Sea Islands, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Taiwan. Now, what I'm about to say has often got me into trouble because barely have I finished a first sentence that I'm shut down and accused of being pro-China. Yet as a journalist and author, it's my role, I believe, to see things or explain things from that alternative viewpoint, even though I might not agree with them. And I might add here that if we had freer discussion along these topics about the drivers of Germany and Japan in the 1930s, or Libya and Iraq in the 1990s, we might have understood enough to avoid war. So onto those flashpoints, the South China Sea is essentially a mirror of America's 19th and 20th century Monroe Doctrine in the Caribbean and Latin America. Don't mess with my backyard. Uh, China's built military island bases to shore up its coastline defenses and protect its supply chains that we were just hearing about against uh, aggressive returning colonial powers, which is exactly what the Monroe Doctrine was about. Now, in 2016, an international court ruled that what China was doing in the South China Sea was illegal under international law. And we have condemned it for violating the so-called rules-based order. But almost simultaneously, but with less reporting, there's been an equally credible court ruling against my government in Britain for its sovereignty claim in the Indian Ocean, a patch of the Indian Ocean that contains America's Diego Garcia military base. Now, the United Nations General Assembly put Britain's policy to the vote, and it came out with 116 against the UK and only six in favour with dozens of abstentions. It was an incredible bellwether of how the developing world rules this rules-based order. And that is what, underneath it all, China is pushing to reform. And if you look at it in terms of a global democratic will, <clears throat> it has a fair amount of support. An argument essentially that Chinese or Asian or developing world values, whatever you might have called it, are at least as equal to Western ones. And that the contradictions that we see in the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea, they need to end. and There needs to be a more level playing field. And I think as you go around the, the Chinese sort of diplomats, think tanks, that sort of thing. This is the argument you hear. That's what the view of that country is. I'll just touch briefly on a, on a couple of other ones before we, I want to finish with Taiwan. In Hong Kong, it, as seen from Beijing, it's a matter of quelling street protests before they spread, it, spread to other cities. It was a straightforward dealing with a, with, with, with a troublesome faraway place if you're sitting in Beijing. Uh, but there was also something else It was shifting the culture and mindset over a generation so that when in 2047 people of Hong Kong woke up and it became just another part of China, they would find that nothing much has changed. They don't suddenly face 
censorship and the lack of freedom of speech and all the rest of it that might be across the border there. The incarceration of Uyghur Muslims uh, is a sledgehammer operation to prevent Xinjiang becoming a new Syria, Libya, Afghanistan or Iraq. There are gross human rights violations. Uh, there are concentration camps. We've seen similar stuff in Tibet over the decades. But I think we need to remember that China also does this to its own people, as we saw during the Cultural Revolution and other upheavals. It's the way the country governs itself. All of those ones that I pointed out that giving that explanation was a pragmatic way of, of how China does things. Um, and what has sort of led, as brutal as it might be, to its current uh, success that it's got at the moment. Taiwan, though, is different. And it could prove to be its Achilles heel. So, as I mentioned, China's success up until now has ridden on result oriented pragmatism. It's transitioning on the surface, at least with Taiwan, to what I call dream oriented emotionalism, chasing former glory and lost territory with rhetoric that's beginning to resemble warlords from failed states, prioritizing conflict and nationalism over development and trade. And it parades its new weapons around like models on a catwalk, unnecessarily creating a recipe that could lead to disaster. But here is the truth, and I convinced they know it in Beijing, uh, China cannot take Taiwan by force or any other way. If it tried, it would lose militarily, economically, and diplomatically. The main island is 100 miles away from the Chinese mainland. It's mountainous, it's inhospitable, perfect landscape for prolonged guerrilla war. And as one senior defense official told me uh, in Taipei, that a Taiwanese insurgency against Chinese control would make America's Iraq look like a child's picnic. Inevitably, the US would become involved. Shipping and trade routes in the region would be negatively impacted or <clears throat> even blocked altogether. Insurance and other costs would rocket. And what does China, China do? It imports 10 million barrels of oil a day and is the world's biggest importer of food. So how would it feed its people and fuel its weapons and factories in a prolonged war with Taiwan? What is unclear, the driver that I don't know, I don't know if, if my colleagues on the panel know, is, is whether Taiwan's nationalist aggression against Taiwan, China's nationalist aggression, is because its expansion is running out of steam. As we've been hearing, the economy is slowing, energy shortages are chronic, debt is spiraling, that time-honored remedy uh, for a dictator to go out and find a war. And does Xi Jinping really see the recovery of Taiwan as the key to maintaining support of the Chinese people? If that is the case, we are actually going into very hazardous times indeed. Because if Xi tries to export Chinese-style communism through the barrel of guns to Taiwan, he will lose. And that failure risks bringing down his whole system. America, as I mentioned before, it can survive losing wars in Vietnam and Afghanistan. The more brittle Chinese system, I don't think can survive failure in Taiwan. And while America's export of democracy to Islamic regions might have failed, its attempts with Confucian societies in East Asia have been successful, not only with Taiwan, but also with Japan and South Korea. But I'm not of the view that China is destined never to enjoy the type of democracy enjoyed in Taiwan. Taiwan began opening up in 1985 when its GDP per capita reached $5,000 a year. That's around $14,000 in today's uh, uh, terms. China's current GDP capita is less than 9,000. And Doug Bando spoke quite accurately about playing the long game. My money is that China will bring in more freedoms and accountability as property ownership goes up and, 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 the voice, and, and the voice of the Chinese people gets more loudly heard around the same time that Taiwan did because it's been proven that democracy does work in a Chinese society. Beijing looks at Taiwan and sees what a success it is. And China has a track record, apart from the rhetoric on Taiwan, of governing with pragmatism and common sense, because that more than anything has been the driver of its success. So as we were 
joking before in the uh, before we went on air, if Xi Jinping happens to be tuning in to this debate, I suggest he follows the advice from Taiwan's president, uh, Jai Ing-wen, who advised recently, I think in foreign affairs, that the key ingredients are patience, resourcefulness, pragmatism, and a stubborn refusal to give up. If we look at China on that long view, I think all of us would be living in a much safer world. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you, Humphrey. Um, EJ, can you put everybody on the screen here? Well, this has been a very stimulating conversation. I'm, 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 I have more things to talk about than we could possibly talk about in the next uh, 25 minutes. But uh, let's start with uh, just a little bit of, of history. I'm in, intrigued by that. Uh, Humphrey, you, you talked about the US and the Monroe Doctrine. I'm aware that all of us come from countries that have a history of discovering land that had already been discovered by the people who are living there and were born there. And uh, China uh, is, you know, shoring up its backyard. There, there's a certain logic there, although it's it's hard to, given China's belligerence, it's because everybody passes through that backyard. Uh, if, uh, also, the century of humiliation they did suffer. I know, you know, we're all familiar with the "No Dogs or Chinese Allowed" sign on the the British Club, and. Michael Pillsbury wrote that book, The Hundred Year Marathon, so, uh, which refers to China getting started in 1949, and their goal is to conclude everything they want to do in world policy, hegemony, whatever, by 2049. So, and, and they're getting out of the ideology. Doesn't that make them more, more uh, can, can you, the three of you, just kind of address a little bit the history of China and where this is going. How is this going to? Are they are they feeling a uh, a burn of manifest destiny that they must accomplish something other than righting the wrongs of the past? I, I think it's a different manifest. They do, but I think it's different to the burn of manifest destiny that we have in the West. So we we taught we sort of go out with the Bible in one hand and trade in the other. Whereas uh, China's got this a different thing is that it, it, it doesn't want to convert anybody as long as they understand that the emperor is in the Middle Kingdom and is the center of the universe. So it, it's all about, I, I was talking to some people about this in, in, in Vietnam, actually, because which has this very difficult relationship with them. And they say, yeah, for a thousand years, we had to go and make trips to the emperor just to show our allegiance. So once you made that trip, you were basically allowed to do what you wanted. And I said, are you going to keep doing that? He said, yeah, of course. They're bigger than us. They're our neighbor. Of course, we're going to do it. Hmm. Uh, and I, mean, I think... Uh, yes, I Cliff? Think... Oh, Cliff and then Doug. Okay. Um, what I would say is when I was over at China, uh, I asked them, what is the proof for the incursion in the South China Sea? Well, they brought out um, the history that went back 2,000 years. So they look at our country and say, okay, this country has been established for maybe 250 years, and we've been around for 5,000 years. And so they have not a respect, but they feel a little bit that the United States does not have the kind of historical legacy that China does. So they outlined with all their documents that the South China Sea belonged to them and the United States was wrong. And the point I'm trying to make is they have such a long history from their kingdoms and even going back to Genghis Khan who tried to conquer uh, Russia and went into China. Uh, I think when you hear them speak about it, they genuinely and sincerely believe that they're in the right because of their history. And I think that has a certain iota of truth when you speak with them about you have to respect part of their history. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug? I think their focus is very much on reclaiming what they believe was improperly taken from them. That is, I don't believe that Xi Jinping is saying, wouldn't it be nice if we could take over Japan, the Philippines, and the Hawaiian Islands? And I don't think that they have a manifest destiny in that sense. 
Now, they, they, they do believe Scarborough Shoal, which, uh, you know, the Filipinos <laughs> claim is theirs. Uh, the Paracel Islands, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, Diayus, or the, the Senkakus, which the Japanese call them. Yeah, and their, their claims, they are, as, as Cliff indicated, rooted in history. Now, I think they have varying degrees of credibility to the claims, because, I mean, everybody has historical claims of who had what when. But I, I, I think that they're bounded in their ambitions, and that's very important that the, uh, you know, what they want to do is reclaim a greatness that they had. Uh, they certainly see the opportunity to be the dominant commercial power, uh, certainly in Asia, and I think they would like to be on earth, uh, but I think that's very different from a military threat. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the history does a lot of this, I think really it does come out of that, that sense of well, what happened to their claims? Well, nobody paid any attention to Imperial China. I mean, you know, to me, the best illustration of what they went through is you go to Shanghai, go to the Bund, you see all of these Western buildings from a century and a half ago. They were part of the Western concession. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to imagine a more dramatic illustration of how a country lost control of its own territory deep within, you know, as opposed to simply, well, they're, they're taking an mm -hmm. island somewhere. And, and this motivates. And you know, they look, they use that for, for gain. I mean, the, the nationalist pressures are real, you know, and the government tries to shape that, but I think it also worries about it. Doesn't want, you know, the nationalism can outrun, mm -hmm. you know, kind of what the government wants. So there's a certain amount of fire being played with there, but I think this is a very real emotion. Most of us in Western countries have seen that in our own countries, you know, they have the same thing going. Yes. Uh, I was in Shanghai in the eighties and I uh, saw these gorgeous stately British mansions, but they all had 10 families living in them. <laughs> they just converted it over. I wanna ask a, uh, I wanna bring up a, a current events topic briefly, and then I wanna talk about money because there's a lot of questions come in the chat window on, on uh, dealing with finances and, and economics. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Cliff on this because you're a, you're a uh, lifetime politician and you know that it always means something when you, show up or you don't show up somewhere. Uh, and, and with China, that goes double for China because uh, they, are, they are filled with meaning. Um, what does it mean that China was a no-show at the climate conference? And the, thing that, and, and the thing that puzzles me about that is that China has signed the Paris Accords. They, are, they, are, uh, they do all the lip service things regarding the economy. Why couldn't uh, Xi Jinping just waltz into Paris like, like he was getting ready to bat clean up for the Yankees. Why did they not go? Well, I think the, the thing was that the obligation and commitment they made in the Paris Accord could not be met. And they are not fulfilling that even the instrumental incremental steps that they agreed to do, they're not doing. In fact, they're building more uh, coal plants and they're importing coal. So it was really it would be pointed out in the press as well as some of the protesters about a sham that uh, China was interested in climate control. So the best thing to do is to try and sort of squ squash it by not showing up. And I think they did a Zoom call in uh, with some of their officials, but the bottom line is they can't comply with the Paris Accord. They don't intend to do it. And frankly, uh, I don't see China in the near term taking the steps that we're taking that the Biden administration is putting forth in that uh, really expending bill of the uh, $2.5 uh, trillion. I see. Doug? Or Doug? Yeah, look, Larry, I think there may be some other issues at stake, one of which is the Biden administration has made very clear that it views this as a critical issue to cooperate with China on, so China wants to use it as leverage. You know, I mean, why is China going to give something away which Washington wants badly? I mean, China has essentially said, you know, you can't dump uh, vitriol all over us and then come and expect us to cooperate with you. That this has to be a relationship that's a positive one if you expect cooperation. So I suspect part of this may simply be a, you act a little standoffish to tell Washington, you know, without having to verbalize it, that uh, you guys want our cooperation, you know. Yeah, you might have to do something. And second is, look, this is a very critical time at home. I mean, this is where the, Xi Jinping wants his third term. There is opposition, it seems, within the party. Now, I don't think that it can stop him, but it would not surprise me that his view is 
th this is a big deal. I mean, they are kind of in terms of historical interpretation, his role, you know, they, they've just put out kind of a, a big story on him that every Chinese media source has covered. You go on and click in, I had a title from, you know, it's in like China Daily, it's in Xuanhua, I mean, it's in everything. You go into Google, put the title in, and you get 20 different sources. So I think this, he probably wanted to stay home to focus on that as well, that that domestic politics is far more important to them right now than any conference. Or, I mean, yeah, you can Zoom your call in. I mean, you know, that, I mean that really isn't a problem. I, th I think there's also um, uh, a face element attached to it as well. <clears throat> Very much, you know, if, if, if he came, all of the stuff that Cliff just said would be headlines of our newspapers. But there's another sort of slight point here is that Britain isn't really an important enough venue to go to. And we just had the gall to send a frigate through the Taiwan Straits and our aircraft carrier and sign a, a new treaty to contain China. So I'm not going to go to Glasgow, to Britain, to be hosted by these people. Uh, and I think that that would be something that would, I think all of those things would play into it. And they say, you know, it's not important enough to do it. Okay. Uh, economics. This is a big, this is a big enigma for me. I mean, we have questions here about cryptocurrencies and, and China owning our debt and things like that. Uh, Keith Best had a very salient question here. Uh, if, if, the China's geopolitical development, their economic development, they've spent an enormous amount on arms buildup. And if, as you said, they can't take Taiwan uh, unless they, I mean, it would be a protracted thing. And, uh, and, uh, and Doug, you said that, uh, that China couldn't survive. I think it was Doug that said that China could not survive uh, a takeover attempt of Taiwan. Uh, the way we survived a failure in Afghanistan, a failure in Vietnam. I would like to know more about that. But, but first, the, uh, the, uh, the economy, they built so much military. Uh, and, and if a country builds military, they use it, don't they? I mean, historically, don't they use it? So, uh, and, and that's a drain on the economy. So what's, what's with that? Where are they going to use A rising power builds the military. Now, one use of the military is intimidation. They want Taiwan, but they don't want a war. You know, so one way you use the military is as a threat. They also have deterrent power. I mean, it's much, the US no longer has the ability to simply wander around and treat uh, East Asian you know, Pacific waters as if it was the Caribbean. I mean, the Chinese could sink our carriers. I mean, they are, you know, what they're showing is the power of deterrence. Very mm -hmm. costly to send your fleet 8,000 miles away, a lot cheaper to use your mainland bases and shoot missiles and sink ships. So this, this from their standpoint, this is defensive, uh, but it is expensive. And look, it's not just you know, the military. They spend more on internal security than external security. It is very costly to have a you know, repressive rule over 1.4 billion people. Uh, you know, so these things are real burdens on the economy, I think, and they do hold them back. And they are paying a high price for that. Hmm. The, um, uh, th th there's another element that's not in Keith's question, actually, but well, two things. Uh, is that firstly, if you're developing a military, you're inventing things and your technology is raising its yeah. game. And, you know, out of all the various wars, we get new things like sat nav and internet and all that comes out of what darpa did so you know there's that sort of thing so that they're, they're going along that line but also i don't know how much money they are how much the budget is it's going into artificial intelligence cyber quantum and the modern mm. warfare which i'm told and i don't know if doug or cliff have, have noted they are way ahead of us on that at the moment and we're playing catch up so yeah. the, you know that 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 they're putting on the catwalk their missiles and their carriers, but underneath it all, they're actually getting the real weapons that can come and strike at the heart of our societies. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the one point is, Larry, that we have such enormous capability, particularly in the land, mine, land nuclear capability that dwarfs China. And I think China looks out across the Pacific and sees this enormous armament in the United States, and they feel that if they're going to at least deter and be credible, they've got to build up their military. So they're forced to do it. 
like like uh, Doug said, if you're going to be a big superpower, you uh, you've got, got to, to uh, have a big army. Like if you get the corner office, you got to get yourself a big black car. <laughs> right? Absolutely. And, well, and a beautiful secretary. <laughs> a beautiful secretary. Uh, let me ask you about the 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 land speculation. I I read a little about the Everglade uh, Corporation and some of these other things. They defaulted on loans. They, as you said, they uh, people are investing in apartments like you would invest in uh, show dogs, or you'd invest in Bitcoin or something like that. Because it's like maybe they don't trust the banks or you can't put it in a jar in the backyard, but but you you can buy an apartment and then you speculate and that becomes currency. That's and how big, how big a part of the economy is this uh, I would call them Bitcoin apartments or whatever you want to call them. Larry, I had mentioned that uh, Everglade, there's a question on your chat about. Does the communist government control all the banks? In the 80s, it was monolithic, but now they have five separate banks. They have an uh, industrial commercial bank of China, the China Construction Bank, the Bank of China, the Bank of Communication, and the Agricultural Bank of China. These five state-owned banks have all these loans. So if, in fact, uh, Everglade and some of these other real estate companies go bankrupt, that's going to impact the Chinese government in terms of they're going to either have to bail them out or let them uh, go into bankruptcy. So that, I think, is really something that even the Federal Reserve just recently announced is a concern because a lot of our mutual funds invest in real estate in China, and that could be an impact on the stock market. But I think that generally the people I talk to politically think that, that before it hits the United States economy, there'll be... Uh, some bailout through the Chinese government because they don't want to look like their economy is faltering because of three or four or 40 different real estate companies. I see. I see. That's uh, and, and so, one, so these, one, other, one other point. Uh, at the end of September, the Chinese government announced that the cryptocurrency is illegal. So Bitcoin is illegal in China. So they've taken a, a stringent steps to say <laughs> that all this cryptocurrency is illegal. And they've done it before, years before, but it's starting to sneak into their economy. And so they wanted to make it perfectly clear that they will not be, uh, they will be prosecuting people that are involved with crypto coin. But the government itself might engage in cryptocurrency transactions, right? Could possibly uh, through their secret uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. Not that they would, because that would be a, that would be wrong. So. Well, Larry, they might make a digital currency, you know, to go along with their uh, their paper currency. I mean, they're exploring a lot of different options. Mm -hmm. I mean, their their economic situation is very dicey because there's a huge amount of money in real estate, and they also have a lot of you know, still state owned enterprises that tend to be very heavily indebted, uh, lots of employees, not very efficient, and they have a lot of loans from state banks. So there's a lot of stuff going on that, you know, economically, you know, they don't have, this is not a, a foundation of, uh, you know, bronze or something. I mean, this, you know, th there's a lot of weakness there that things could go bad. And, and they're very worried about Evergrande. I mean, and it's not the only one. There are other, uh, you know, real estate uh, entrepreneurs and firms out there that also have a lot of bad debts, not clear they can service them. So th there's, there's a real nervousness in China, I think, at the moment over this. Oh, I remember... I'm sorry, sorry Larry. Oh, well, Humphrey, I, I what do you just, think? I, me, I, I was, I'm a, I'm, I'm a barefoot reporter. So, I mean, the, the, no, I, I remember when I was in Beijing, we're going back into the 90s, the, the BBC bureau chief, we did a number of stories. And I remember once going up to the north, the area in the North Korean border, and we drove on these roads that were sort of six lane highway roads with no cars on them. We would pass luxury developments and golf courses and nobody there. And then we were on the on the border where household names, South Korean companies have built these huge factories because they were expecting yeah. it. To go. And whenever you went for a briefing with, you know, diplomats or think tanks, you would have the same conversation about the Chinese economy and, and, and everything like that. Yet they 
they held it together. They held it together through the 97 Asian financial crisis a, a bit. They held it together through the 2008 crisis. And there are a lot of very, very smart people up there. Like I said, they barely put a foot wrong. So I think, yes, it's moving in the wrong direction at the moment. But I personally think they'll pull it out without having a 2008 similar Lehman Brothers thing going on in China. Huh. So um, the uh, because we, this is this is uh, this is a, a, a Korea Peninsula issues seminar. So I have to ask you a Korea topic here. And and uh, and David Casbo gave us a great one here. How do these? What's going on with China? How does it affect the Chinese? Korea relationship. Uh, Mao Zedong said China and North Korea were as close as teeth and lips. Uh, and but they, and they, in in his uh, in his autobiography, Kim Il Sung actually wrote lots of nice things about China. But I don't know how much of that was for public consumption. So what's going on with North Korea? How is it affected by what's going on in China? It would like to get out from under China, right? Well, it wants to have protect its independence. I mean, their relationship has never been that close. Uh, the, the North Koreans are absolutely determined on their own independence, and they fear the close neighbors for good reason. You know, you can be suffocated by that close neighbor. I think one reason they'd like to have a relationship with the U.S. is to give them another option. Uh, until uh, you know, the spring of 2018, with the impending Trump-Kim you know, summit, uh, Xi Jinping had not met Kim Jong-un. I mean, Xi Jinping made it very clear he didn't like Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un executed his uncle. His uncle was the primary interlocutor with China. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's a, just, there's a lot that went there. But the moment the Chinese saw the U.S. moving in, they were very nervous about losing their position. And suddenly there were five meetings between uh, Xi and Kim. At the moment, it looks like North Korea is increasingly relying on China for economics. That, and the Chinese have been much more supportive. I think that this is, you know, this is not a, a relationship based on love, but it's uh, on practical. China wants a buffer state. North Korea wants to survive, and it's trying to survive under very difficult circumstances. It isolated itself because of COVID. So and the Chinese are not going to turn North Korea over to the US. They don't want a united Korea. They don't want the US troops on their border. You know, so th this is something where it, this is not that we have to work with them and find ways to kind mm -hmm. of try to assuage their concerns. In the short term, I think that that mm -hmm. relationship is going to be, remain a very tough one. Well, suppose China, suppose China decided to, instead of leaning on China, lean on somebody else and move a little closer to the, uh, to, to the West. This is a question put forth by Alan Jessen here in the chat window uh, and, and uh, decided to, to try to make nice with the West a little bit because uh, it, it, we have the same thing that, uh, that China gives them. How would China feel about that? If it wasn't Kim Jong-un, say his successor, decide to move more closely to the West, where would that put China? And I, I think it's got, because the, the sanctions that are on North Korea at the moment are quite similar to the sanctions, or, or worse than the sanctions that are on Vietnam when it was trying to come out of the cold. And for, mm -hmm. and, for, and for North Korea to come out of the cold, those sanctions need to be lifted. And that's up to a U.S., administration to do that. So until they're lifted, North Korea is, in the, is going to keep treading water, as it were, and, and, it, and it'll have a, a good and bad time with China, but that will be rock solid. Um, okay. And until its economy can grow uh, in, in a sort of international way, things are going to stay as they are. And possibly that's how South Korea, the US and China and Russia all want it to be. Oh, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. I wanted each one of you to have just a, a minute to give a, a final parting thought. We'll just take them in the order that you, uh, that you spoke in. So uh, there's so many topics we didn't talk about. Uh, China making all of our pharmaceuticals and our dependency on them. Uh, the debt trap diplomacy in Africa, as uh, somebody alluded to here, and, and uh, uh, many other topics we didn't get a chance to, to do. Um, Cliff, would you like to say something? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, Larry, just in concluding, uh, <clears throat> until we leave troops, until the troops leave South Korea, China is not going to allow North Korea to uh, work with the U.S. to do anything, I think, because 
that many troops hostile to China, that proximity would be very difficult. I'll just conclude by saying that it's going to take, as both uh, Humphrey and Doug mentioned, it's going to take skilled diplomacy to try and weed ourselves through a uh, what appears to be a start of a Cold War mm -hmm. so that we can be cooperative with them. But in the end, with a socialistic communist country, you realize that there are people that are oppressed and under the control of a communist party. And they, they mm -hmm. antithetical antithetical to all the values that we as Americans cherish. Yes. So thank you, Larry, for the time. Congressman, thank you very much. Uh, Doug, your thoughts? I think we want to view Ch China as a challenge, not as an enemy, uh, that uh, the 21st century will be very different if we can work out our problems with them and cooperate, as opposed to end up in a conflict. Neither of us benefits from a conflict. The world doesn't benefit. And I think we want to stay away from demonization. There's, I mean, the human rights issues are very important. And I write a lot about those. But demonizing China doesn't help. We want to appeal to young people there. We want to be very careful of nationalism, insulting them and their country. You know, this requires nuance and sophistication. This isn't going to be easy. But uh, we need to get this one right. If we don't get this one right, I mean, the, the, the coming century looks a lot worse. So that we got to work on this one. Very good. Nobody hates China. Thank you for taking the high road on that, Doug. Uh, Humphrey. I, uh, I completely agree with Doug. We, we mustn't demonize Xi Jinping. He's not Saddam. He's not Gaddafi. Don't personalize it because it's a big thing. But I would say that over the next hundred years, if you follow that Taiwan economic thing of the 5,000 per capita GDP, uh, Taiwan did it under under American mentorship, but partly because it was a pragmatic and practical way to be accountable to a population that was becoming more educated and more wealthy. So a hundred years from now, China might be socialist, but it'll have some form of accountability, it'll have a lot more freedoms, and it'll have some form of democracy. Ah, EJ, thank you very much, Humphrey, thank you. EJ, can you put everybody on the screen so we can, uh, while we say our bye-byes here, we can kind of see who is, who is in the room? and put your, put your view on gallery and you can see everybody. And there's, uh, we filled up three screens and, and we, had, uh, we had a good collection of people who are very thoughtful questions. Uh, thank you all very much. Gentlemen, I would love to spend an evening with you uh, as far into the night as, uh, as everybody in this room would. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your, your participation and your, your, your goodwill. Thank you very much. Take care, thank everybody. You. Bye -bye. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Uh, excellent program. Thank you.